Thank you so much for the introduction. Hi, my name is Steven Goldfeder, and today I'll be talking about fast multi-party threshold ECDSA. So hopefully some of those words will be familiar, but really more hopefully by the end of the talk, some of those words will be familiar. Uh, so digital signatures in Bitcoin uh, or transactions really in any cryptocurrency system are authenticated by digital signatures. And what that means is an Alice wants to send Bob some money, Alice will sign a transaction that says, hey, pay this coin C to Bob. And she goes ahead and signs that transaction with her private key. Now notice that Alice's private key is a single point of failure. Anyone who attacks or compromises Alice's device will learn her private key and can now send money to whoever they like. And that's a bit of a problem. So what's the way around this? How does one protect their key and not have this single point of failure where anyone can just sort of drain your funds? And the answer is you want to avoid a single point of failure by having a redundancy. So you have multi-party authentication. Instead of having just a single device which stores your key material, you split it among multiple devices and say, hey, in order to spend this coin, I have to sign not only from this device, but from this device, this device, and this device. Or maybe some more complicated policy like here are five devices, and if three of them sign, then this transaction is valid. And the good news is... Bitcoin has a feature uh, called multi-signatures, which does just this, and it's one of the oldest features uh, added to Bitcoin, and essentially what it does is exactly that. You can have an address where you say, instead of this being a single key address, this is a multi-sig address. So I add n, n keys to this address, and then I specify some number t and say, in order for this transaction to be valid, you need to sign with t of these keys. And here in the example, we have Alice and, uh, or we have three people, and she splits her key. They split their key such that any two of them need a sign. This is what we call a two of three multi-sig. So these two, two, two here, red and green, are signing, but again, really could be any of those two signed. And the idea is the transaction is valid as long as two of these things are signed. And that's really great. So we're done, right? No. Because multi-sig has a few problems, and I won't get into them too much today, but I'll sort of just highlight them very briefly. First of all, they're inflexible. Say you're a company and you have maybe seven employees and you want to have some policy that as long as three employees sign off, they can spend the company's money. But if only two employees sign, then they can't. Well, okay, you can use a multi-sig for that, a three of seven multi-sig and perfect. As long as three people sign off, everything is spent. But now say an employee leaves. And so, or say an employee joins, and now you want to change the access structure. But with multi-signatures, the access structure is fundamentally tied to the address. And what that means is if you want to change the access structure by adding an employee or removing an employee, you need to go ahead and actually move money on the blockchain. And that's not a very good thing. And the second thing is everything's public. Everyone sees the exact access structure of this company. The blockchain has these seven signatures and it knows the rule, it's these seven keys and it knows that three of them need to sign off in order for a transaction to be valid. So this is not a very good state of affairs uh, where these three, where, where everything is public, you have a company and they want to have sort of privacy in their books, but their entire access structure is completely public for everyone. And the third thing is, they grow, they're inefficient. You have to, if you want to do a three of seven multi-sig, then with every transaction, you have to include not one signature, but three signatures. And in a world where blockchain space is so, so, um, so limited and so competitive to get yourself into the blockchain, making transactions two, three, four, five times larger is A, gonna be expensive, and also just gonna be a waste of very precious space. So what could we do about that? And the answer is, instead of using multi-signatures, we use something very similar, which is called a threshold signature. And a threshold signature, you can think of it as a stealth multi-signature, because it does basically the same thing. You have T out of N, uh, again, a threshold signature scheme, which is you specify some number N, and there are N people in the group, and as long as T of them, or T plus one of them sign off, everyone's happy and they can sign the message. But if T of them get together, or less than T of them get together, they can't do anything. They can't learn anything about the key, they can't authorize transactions, and they can't sign messages. So this sounds exactly like what I described for multi-sig. So what's the difference between a multi-signature and a threshold signature? And the difference is, well, what does it look like on the blockchain? A multi-signature, you put seven keys on the blockchain. In a threshold signature, you do this on the client side. You take a single key and you split it up to seven people. But the result is just a single signature. And what this means is when I put a signature on the blockchain, it has this three of seven structure to it, or whatever structure it is, but to everyone else in the world, it just looks like a regular signature. To everyone else in the world, they don't know 
that this was a threshold signature. They don't know if it was a threshold signature, what the access policy is. So you get really, really good privacy. And you also get efficiency because you only have to put a single signature on the blockchain. On the blockchain and even though it looks like a single signature, really behind the scenes, this is a multi-sig in, in, in a stealth manner. And that's what we call a threshold signature. OK, that's great, threshold signatures. Now, what does this have to do with Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin uses, um, again, keys to, to secure their transactions, as is every other cryptocurrency. And the idea is, with a threshold signature, the, just as with multi-sig, the, there's a single private key, but that private key never existed on any device. This private key didn't exist in key generation. It was done completely, completely distributively, and it didn't exist uh, when, when, when you want to go ahead and sign. You never construct this private key. So if an attacker, if the threshold is T, and an attacker sits on T minus one devices, or one or two or three devices, the attacker learns absolutely nothing, and it can't steal your signatures. Okay, it can't steal your, your you can't steal your key, and it can't sign in your behalf. So you don't no longer have a single point of failure. That's threshold signatures in general. Bitcoin and Ethereum and lots of other cryptocurrencies use ECDSA, which stands for the Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. The digital signature algorithm was standardized in the 1990s by NIST, and of late, the elliptic curve variant is what's become popular. But for the purpose of this talk, there's no difference between the, whether it's implemented over elliptic curve groups or not. And so we know what threshold signatures are. And then, so hey, can we take Bitcoin's ECDSA signature scheme and can we build threshold signatures uh, for that? And so why are we using ECDSA? Again, it's for backwards compatibility because basically almost every project out there uses ECDSA signatures. They're widely used and although there are many efforts in Bitcoin and other, and other currencies to get rid of these or to at least add another option, those efforts have been stalled for years and even if they do succeed eventually in Bitcoin or another currency, which it looks like they, they may succeed in Bitcoin, ECDSA isn't going anywhere and that's why we sought to tackle the problem of ECDSA threshold signatures. Uh, but I'll be honest, if you are building a system which you do not need to be backwards compatible with ECDSA, you may very well want to use threshold signatures in your protocol to protect your keys or in other places in your protocol, but you probably won't want to use ECDSA because, as we'll see, ECDSA is a very, very difficult algorithm to build a threshold signature scheme for. So, essentially, there are two takeaways, uh, large takeaways from the talk today. One will be... I believe that threshold signatures are very, very useful, and they may be very useful in the protocols you're building and the systems you're designing. Second takeaway is if you're using ECDSA or if you need to be compatible with Bitcoin or Ethereum or another system that uses ECDSA, we now have a very efficient scheme for doing that. But if you don't need ECDSA, there may be even more efficient schemes, and there are. So let's take a look at ECDSA and understand what the technical problem is. And uh, just uh, as a warning, this is sort of the only mathematical slide that I'm going to give today. Other thing else will be very, very high level. Um, so if you want to tune out and meet me at the next slide, that's totally fine. And uh, essentially, ECDSA, you have a group G of order N, and you have a generator G that generates that group. And you have a private key X, which is chosen in the order of the group. And then to sign a message, you choose this other value, which is like the private key, but it's a one-time use private key called a nonce, and that's the value k. And you choose the nonce such that k is between 1 and n minus 1, again, where n is the order of the group. And you compute two values, r, which is uh, g to the k, so you exponentiate the generator you use, uh, with k, the nonce, and s, which is k inverse m plus x r mod n. And the signature is rs. Now, that may have sounded like gibberish to you, but here's the point. If you see those red values there, there's K and then there's X. And it turns out that if those things leak, if those things aren't secure, if an attacker learns either K or X and has a signature, then they learn your entire key. X is the key, and from K also you can, uh, from K and a signature, you can compute the key. So K and X uh, need to be kept um, very, very secure, and they need to be always distributed in this threshold manner. That is, an attacker sitting on one or two or three devices should never be able to learn uh, those, those, those things. But the issue is, uh, if you look at it, it's a bit tricky what we do with these values. We take k, and k, again, is a value that's shared among many people, and they sort of computing with it. And we want to compute its inverse. And we also want to exponentiate with it, and we also want to uh, do a distributed multiplication uh, with k and, and x. So essentially, you have multiplication, addition, inversion, and exponentiation going on here. And it turns out to be a very, very difficult protocol to build in a threshold manner. Again, to build in a way such that uh, it's kept distributed the entire time, and k and x are never leaked by less than the threshold number of machines. Uh, in previous work, um, I, together with uh, some others, uh, Rosario Gennaro, Arvind Narayanan, and Dan Bonet, 
uh, built a threshold ECDSA signature scheme from threshold PIE homomorph threshold additively homomorphic encryption. We use PIE, and the idea is very simple. The idea is you take um, an encryption scheme, and in this encryption scheme, this encryption scheme has some properties that allow you to multiply to add in and multiply some numbers into it. And the idea is everyone takes their shares and they create an encryption of a signature. And now they use, a, instead of using a threshold signature protocol, they use a distributed threshold decryption protocol to go ahead and decrypt that signature. And then they go ahead and they decrypt the signature and they learn the signature. The issue is uh, we know how to do threshold decryption, so that's good, but we don't really know how to do distributed key generation for threshold PIE very efficiently. What that means is in order for this to work, every party needs to have a share of this PIE key. They need to have a distributed share of the threshold decryption scheme, and it turns out that to do the distributed sharing, it's very, very expensive. It's never been implemented, and it probably will take hours to do. So what this means is, while the signing protocol using this scheme is very efficient, you can use threshold ECDSA and create signatures uh, in the distributed manner, the key generation is not efficient, and it's really only practical, this scheme, when you have a dealer who goes ahead and generates a key on their own computer, and then distribute shares to all the people, and then from then on, the system is secure, assuming that the dealer deletes the key. But the problem is, of course, if the dealer's, if the dealer's machine is compromised, that's a single point of failure. So what you really, really want is a threshold uh, ECDSA scheme where the dealing also happens in a distributed manner. That is, there's not a dealer that, that deals a key and then distributes it. Instead, everyone sort of creates the key distributively such that there's never, ever any point in time where the key was ever leaked. And uh, in a new paper, uh, which will be appearing next week at CCS, uh, we have a new threshold uh, ECDSA scheme that doesn't rely on threshold, um, thre on threshold the decryption and doesn't rely on threshold PIE. It uses PIE, but only um, a single key PIE where every player has this PIE key. And it's highly efficient. It's, it's uh, the distributed, um, distributed key generation runs in less than a second. Again, before it would have been hours. Now it runs in less than a second. It's a faster protocol than before. It's simpler, and it greatly reduces the bandwidth. So just to pause for a second, this is essentially uh, sort of the main takeaway uh, that I want to uh, uh, present today, which is I'm not going to go into the details for the sake of time of how exactly uh, this, is, this exists, but I want you to think of it as a black box, that if you have a protocol in which you use an ECDSA signature, we now have a very, very, very efficient protocol by which you can go ahead and distribute that signing in the threshold manner. Again, where you can get multi-sig functionality but end up with just a single key such that there was never, ever any point in time where that key was um, ever leaked. And that's sort of the main takeaway. The if you're interested in the, in the technical details of how we did it, and unfortunately it would take longer than the scope of this talk, and, but the paper um, is available and you can read that. Um, but the idea is I want to think this as a primitive for building your protocols that ECDSA threshold signatures exist and they're highly efficient. And with that, I want to turn to some applications. And my goal today really is, again, to sort of make you aware that this thing exists threshold ECDSA signatures that you, and get you thinking about how in your protocol, in your system, in your project, you can use these. And uh, to motivate that, I'll give a few examples, but I'm really hoping that people will walk away with this with other examples um, that how it applies to them. And the first example is one we discussed, which is obvious, better security for user wallets. So you have a wallet, and now on your phone, you have a key that sits there, and your key signs, and your money is sent. But if someone compromises your phone, they will have stolen all of your money, and that's not a good thing. So a threshold signature, a threshold signature multi-factor wallet will split the key material on your, on your phone, on your computer, such that you'll have multiple devices which each have a single share of the key. But if I lose my phone, or I lose my computer, or maybe even if I lose both of them, the attacker who compromises these devices will still learn nothing and will not be able to uh, learn anything about my key or forge my signatures, and I'll be able to recover. Uh, it turns out now that um, there actually is a company that, that, that's implementing a threshold signature multi, uh, Bitcoin wallet. I think they've only done the two-party case yet, so splitting the key amongst two parties. But they're looking at this, and they're building code for this. And th this is an Israeli company called uh, KZN Network. So I encourage you to check them out and see uh, how you can uh, use what they're doing um, to secure your own Bitcoins or contribute to them. The second uh, application that I want to highlight is security as a service. 
And here's the idea. So think about you're an exchange, and um, you have a lot of transactions coming in. People always request send you money. I also request withdrawals. And what you do is you have some rules, and you say, hey, does this account match up? Does this person have funds? Is this past the withdrawal limit? And you validate their withdrawal request, and then you go ahead and you send them, you send them their, their Bitcoins or their Ether or whatever currency they're requesting. But sometimes, you know, things, if, the, if the exchange is storing all their keys on site or on their own servers, things can happen where someone gets into their servers and extracts their key and steals all, steals all their money. And this happens all the time where exchanges go down, and we don't know why they go down. Maybe because it could be an internal attack where someone in the exchange, someone that worked for the exchange goes ahead and steals all the keys and steals the money for themselves and runs away. It could be an external attacker. It's often not clear. So there are companies now where the idea is to offer security as a service in which I have an exchange, but I offload part of my key to a different company, a security as a service company, and they provide the service that whenever a, a, the exchange gets a withdrawal request, they send it to the service provider and say, hey, could you validate this? And if so, you sign it with your key portion as well. And the idea is that the exchange themselves doesn't have the key material. They can't, um, they can't send the money out themselves on, with, the, with these withdrawal requests. They need the participation of the service provider. And similarly, the service provider themselves doesn't have the key material either, and they can't, the only thing they can do is say yes or no to a transaction that the exchange, uh, the exchange suggested. They can't go ahead and steal the money themselves, and perhaps the exchange will have in a backup wallet somewhere something that will, that if something goes wrong and the service provider goes offline, it can recover, but in the online, at least in what's online, the exchange will not have enough key material that it can uh, send transactions. And it turns out that there's another Israeli company called Curve that's implementing this, uh, looking into using these protocols like this um, to build uh, an enterprise service like this uh, where they um, where they are actually securing money for exchanges and they have, I believe, um, agreements with many, many large enterprise players already. And again, that company is called Curve. Uh, and I, I encourage you to check out what they're doing as well. And the next class of protocols that I want you to think about, and this may be more interesting to people who are looking into sort of building their own uh, cryptocurrency systems or tokens, are multi-party protocols. So sometimes the, the protocols we discussed so far are examples where there's one person or one company that has a key, and they're splitting the key up so that they can get extra security and extra protection over that key. But fundamentally, there's only one company and one person. But you also have protocols which you want multiple people to go ahead and sign a document or sign a message or agree on something. And in these protocols, again, there are multiple players, but we can use threshold signatures to go ahead and aggregate these signatures. So for example, think about layer two protocols. So state channels is an example, and also Arbitrum, which is another project that I'm involved in, and Ed Felton will be talking about that tomorrow, and I encourage you to listen to his talk. And the idea in these systems is that um, parties execute code off-chain, doesn't hit the blockchain, and then they go ahead and everyone just sort of signs and they agree what happened. And then in certain cases, they'll go ahead and put those signed statements on the blockchain. So again, everyone sort of just agrees what happened. They say, we all agree. There, maybe there are N participants in the system, and everyone says, this is what happened. We, we're all in agreement, and everyone signs a statement. And then at some point in time, it may become necessary for them to go ahead and prove that everyone agreed, so they go ahead and put this statement on the blockchain. Well, there are N signatures there. So if you have 100 people in this party, the transaction is going to be really, really, really big because there are 100 signatures that have to be attached. Instead, what you can do is you can use a threshold signature scheme, an N of N threshold signature scheme, such that in order to sign, you need everyone's participation. But again, the key difference is you don't come out with 100 signatures. You come out with a single signature. So there's only one signature at the end, but this signature proves essentially that all 100 people signed off. And this is far more efficient because when you put this on the blockchain, it's just a single signature. Independent of how many people you have in your protocol, that's all happening off-chain, that's all happening offline. The only thing that hits the blockchain is a single signature, and it's A, doesn't use up lots of blockchain space, but uh, also importantly, it doesn't use up lots of uh, minor verification time. The miners don't have to verify 100 signatures, they just have to verify one single signature. Uh, another multi-party uh, protocol which uh, this has applications to is escrow protocols. At this conference last year, I actually spoke about uh, privacy-preserving escrow protocols, and it turns out 
that with multi-signatures, uh, with threshold signatures, sorry, you can build some really elegant protocols. And the idea is you have Alice and Bob who want to uh, do some business transaction, but they don't trust each other. So Alice wants to buy a book from Bob, and Alice says, hey, Bob, send me the book, and I'll go ahead and pay you. And Bob says, not so fast, pay me first, and then I'll send you the book. And uh, it turns out that for physical items, the way that you handle this is you have some escrow, escrow agent, some trusted escrow agent that... Um, sort of mediates this transaction, and they can, if in case of dispute arises, they can go ahead and decide who's right. And you can do this with a two or three threshold signature really elegantly, where uh, there are three shares of the key. You pay, everyone pays the money into, the, the seller pays the money, sorry, the buyer pays the money into this address, and this address is controlled jointly by the buyer, the seller, and the escrow agent. And you only need two of their participation. So when the buyer and seller agree, they go ahead and the seller gets paid. If there's a disagreement, the buyer or seller together with the escrow agent can go ahead and choose uh, who won or lost. And you can do this with multi-sig as well, but as we show in that paper and as I discussed last year, there are lots of privacy, subtle privacy issues that come up and threshold signatures give you an avenue to, um, to do this in a completely privacy preserving manner. And the basic idea is, and this is where I'm hoping people think uh, and sort of think how this applies to your protocol, for multi-party protocols, if you have multi-party protocols that require parties to go ahead and sign off on something, and this doesn't have to be unanimous consent where everyone signs off, it could be any access structure, or maybe where T of N people sign off, or maybe some more complicated access structure, you can do this with a threshold signature, and it's generally, um, A, it's private, because the signature that results doesn't tell you uh, the details of how it was made or who, which, par which parties participated in signing it. All you know is that it's valid, but nothing else. And B, it's more efficient because instead of coming up with a list of signatures um, from all the end parties, you end up with a single signature and it's really quick to verify and it's really short. And again, my hope is that um, you can, this will fit into uh, many, many other applications that I haven't highlighted today. And uh, to to sort of con to conclude, then um, my main my first takeaway is threshold signatures are very useful for many applications, and we've gone through uh, securing your digital currency assets, as well as to uh, threshold signatures at a company, threshold signatures as a service, as well as uh, multi-party protocols such as escrow and layer two protocols. And that's a general statement, nothing to do with ECDSA threshold signatures. So if you have a clean slate design and you're not beholden to ECDSA, you might want to take a look at Schnorr signatures and say, hey, this is a really nice pr signature protocol that has a really elegant threshold protocol, or BLS signatures as, as an alternative to, e to, to ECDSA. But you might want to look at threshold signatures no matter what you're doing because they're, they're very, very nifty and can help in lots of protocols and in securing system. The second takeaway is if you are using a system which has ECDSA threshold signatures, our new CCS paper um, has does this in a fast and completely trustless manner where you can do the distributed key generation and do threshold signing extremely quickly uh, with absolutely no trust. And I encourage you to take a look at that and see how it applies um, to um, other projects and other ideas. And the third thing is, as I, I mentioned two companies, but we're now, I mean, I've been giving this talk for approximately five years on different papers and I've been preaching, but um, you know, as time goes on, the protocols get better. And uh, understandably, in the previous protocols, the threshold, the, the key generation was not very efficient, so no one really used them. Now we're finally starting to see companies uh, using this, tech, using this tech, you know, similar technologies in their, uh, in their products, and I encourage you to uh, look deeply into these things and see how, how it may apply to your project. And the last thing I want to say is that uh, if anyone's interested in getting involved in producing a, an open source library for uh, such protocols, a production quality open source library, uh, come find me and I'm happy to talk about that. Thank you so much for listening. Happy to take questions. Very cool talk. Thank you very much. Sure. Back, uh, two questions real quick. So one of them, any considerations for the number of keys constituting the threshold since the going to be four, five, or hundred thousand? That's the question. Yeah, so um, yeah, so so the first que the, so the first question was, um, well, sorry, 
Yeah, so if there, is there a consideration on the numbers? How big can these numbers TNN get? And that's actually another benefit of threshold signatures over, over multisig. It turns out in multisig, at least on the Bitcoin blockchain, N has to be relatively small. You can only have about 15 keys specified. Uh, in our multi-sig protocol, it's an interactive protocol, so it will take a few seconds more or a few milliseconds more, but you can essentially do unbounded TNN. In practice, when you're designing protocols, these things get hard to keep track of, so you're probably not going to want to. You're probably going to want to keep TNN relatively small, but uh, the protocol scales uh, extremely well, and you can do um, TNN um, essentially arbitrarily. And the second question was... Yes, different classes of keys. So there's actually um, a very, so there are two things you can do. First of all, you can have, if you want completely separate class, classes, a nice thing you can do is you can have, you can, you can share your keys such that there are two independent sharings. So these people have a three of three sharing of the key, and these people have a two of seven sharing of the key, and these produce the same signatures, but they're completely different sharings. Something you can't do with a multi-sig. With multi-sig, the policy is there specified. With threshold signatures, you can share the key in multiple ways and do things like this. And there also is uh, general research in um, relating to secret sharing in general. There are papers of how to uh, achieve what's known as arbitrary access structures. And it turns out some access structures you can do succinctly and where everyone has a small share and some you can do um, not succinctly or we don't know how to do that succinctly. The idea is, if you again, since you can have multiple sharings, you can implement any policy you want um, by just sort of specifying a different sharing for every possible uh, member of the group, but then the size of everyone's key gets exponential because for every possible combination, everyone has a different key sharing. There are access structures you can do uh, efficiently, but uh, we don't know how to do every access structure efficiently. Sure. Thanks. Sure.